Frames of Reference. Three films, two cinephiles, one podcast. Cinema is my secret passion. It's a foreign movie. A film is what it is. But art films make people feel funny. This film was a personal vision, not a marketing machine. We're getting too many mainstream movies. Episode 3, Garigmania. Why, hello. <laughs> Good evening. You are not Matt. I, I am not... It's a very good observation. <laughs> it has also been four years since our last episode. So why don't you introduce yourself, not Matt? Hi, I'm Sarah, distinctly not Matt. Four years now into the future. I am a recent college graduate in biology, so we are carrying on the STEM tradition. Yeah, I am a very casual moviegoer, so casual that I oftentimes miss the movie and then am playing catch up. So here I am, and I like to write and play the cello, but uh, mostly I'm just trying to do science and talk <laughs> about stuff with you, very random, obscure things with you. Yes, all of, all of the random, obscure fandom details. <laughs> but no, you do have a, you do bring a, a, often an interesting lens to discussing media. We talk about media a lot, and I feel like this series, it's going to change a little bit. We're going to have to kind of retool the dynamic, but it should still provide some really interesting media analysis as we, as ever, continue to take three films and try to splice together ideas by theme or a director's career and look at the movies that we consume and where they're coming from. I'm very excited because I feel like I very often will watch a movie and then I'm like, I gotta like get some thoughts about it. I want to try and get more out of the film. But so yeah. this will be a great opportunity for me to like actually figure out how I feel about movies and what I think about them instead of just passively being like, oh yeah, that's a movie I watched. Yeah. And that's, and that's really what like discovering being a cinephile is, you know, how do we interact with things? How do we go deeper in our understanding of our world because of the films that we're watching? I think the films that we're discussing today are a really excellent look at that. You know, we are both people who are young professionals trying to make sense of our world. And Greta Gerwig, who we're doing a deep dive on today, has really captured that over the last decade. Yeah, I had not until like when we sat down to like plan this episode, I had only seen one Gerwig film and it was Little Women, which is an adaptation. So this was a very new thing for me. And I loved all three of them, which I was not expecting to actually. Yeah, and there's a lot in common here between all three of them. To be clear, we're discussing Frances Ha, which she co-wrote with her partner, Noah Baumbach, who directed it, and then her directorial debut, Lady Bird, and the record-smashing behemoth that is Barbie. This summer is Barbie's world, and we're just living in it. I have not seen Oppenheimer, but I am I am safe to say like I am, I am a Barbie girl, and this is Barbie's world. I really liked this movie. I really enjoyed Oppenheimer. I thought I had some issues with it. Shockingly, I I don't think Nolan is a perfect filmmaker. Gasp. Um, that's heresy. But I, I really think Barbie is the film that's going to like stay with me for a while. And I, I remember when it was first announced, it feels like years ago now, that, that Gerwig was taking on this project. I was just like, I want to see this. I It's like outrageous, but also cohesive, which is a wonderful combo. Like everything, I was like, whoa, everything's crazy and huge. And it's like, insane in like so many parts and everything has its place yes it's very intricate so yeah this film really took over on a scale that you know lady bird and francis ha never could so it's interesting to chart that trajectory coming from very humble roots to being literally the biggest film of the year so greta gerwig is a central figure in what is often called mumblecore cinema Now, that started as a derisive term in the mid-2000s when people at film festivals would describe movies in which the characters are all in their mid-20s, usually white, and they just sit and talk about philosophy and life the entire movie while nothing material happens. That derisive term eventually got reclaimed by the filmmakers working in that space. Noah Bamba, Greta, Greta Gerwig are some of the forerunners of that. And really, you can say Francis Ha is the crowning achievement of that movement. And while Mumblecore has died out in the last decade, we can see the traces of it very much in Lady Bird, but also in a film as grand in scope as Barbie. Yeah, I I really enjoyed Francis Ha. When you talk when you're talking about like the Mumblecore definition, I 
just made me think of like every undergrad creative writing classroom in a liberal arts college. Yeah, no, it's it's ev- it's every like sophomore college written play, oh, or every student yeah. film. Um, the, the the defining factor here is though that it's all cohesive and. We, we see, you know, relationships that don't necessarily get resolved. We don't have a satisfactory ending, but we feel profoundly connected to these characters because these characters are three-dimensional and have a lot of depth. It was very interesting because Frances Ha felt very, like, and to some extent Lady Bird as well, Frances Ha felt very, like, zoomed out, and you're just seeing, like, chunks of her life and relating to it deeply if you're in your 20s after college trying to figure out your life. It's almost Woody Allen-esque vignettes just without all of the, you know, Woody Allen. Yeah, and then you finish it and you're like, I'm so connected to everything that happened in this film. Even though it's like you, I felt as a viewer, like you were sort of a detached viewer just kind of looking into Francis's life. And it was a very Mm -hmm. like zoomed out look, but you felt at the same time deeply connected to everything that happened in it, which I loved. All these films are kind of about nothing, but they're also about everything. And there's a lot of common experience in all three of them that everyone can connect to. Yeah. And like with each of these characters, all three movies, they leave you with a very profound sense of human relationships between Mm -hmm. like one another, even though really none of them really hinge on like a romance, but it's almost about like falling in love with your life and the people around you and your friendships. The romance consistently takes the backseat in all of these movies, really. It really does. And you are left with a richer tapestry of existence, which I was very touched by in all three films. In in fact, it's almost as if the platonic friendship is treated as the romance plot in these films and the romance falls to the backside. Yes. I was thinking about that a lot with Francis Ha and Lady Bird. Yep. About like falling in love with your your friends, falling in love with your best friend, falling in love with, you know… And when I say falling in love, I don't mean like a romantic, like sexual love. I'm talking about like just a deep love and connection with another person going through life with you, whatever that means to whoever you are. Yeah, uh, like Philia love. They are love movies without being, yeah, without being love, they're love movies. So let's start with Francis Ha. It came out in 2012. It was directed by Noah Baumbach. And like we said, it was co-written by Baumbach and Gerwig. They had met on a movie the year pre- previously, and this was their first real project together. It premiered at Telluride Film Festival in 2012, had a limited award season run with IFC. And it maintained a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes and made a lot of critics top 10 lists that year. In the U.S., it's available on Blu-ray from the Criterion Collection. And in the U.K., it's available from Metrodome. Though I do know that the Criterion release is a little bit better regarded, so you might want to consider importing that. And if you are like to watch things on streaming, it's available on Netflix and on AMC+. So let's talk about this movie. This this film really revolves around our character, Frances Halliday. Uh, Frances Ha, as she abbreviates her name in the final shot of the film. Who is Frances? She's 27, uh, working as a dancer at a dance studio in New York City, living with her absolute best friend from college, Sophia. And then that friendship also, it sort of just covers the tumultuousness that can happen in the kind of like in-betweenness of life stages. Uh, She actually says at one point in the movie, like, I'm not a real person yet. Yeah, Frances is 27 and quite frankly, a bit immature. She is, but she has an old face as well, which I was like, oh my goodness. Like the, um, the scene where a character tells her like, you're like young, but you're old at the same time. I was like, damn. Yes. 27 though. <laughs> um, the And her friend it decides to, she wants to move to Tribeca because Tribeca is where it's happening. Frances's career is not where her friend's is. She's constantly broke. So Tribeca, obviously, for those who know New York, is entirely out of the picture. <laughs> So she's forced to find somewhere else to live, and she kind of bounces around peripheral friends, living with two uh, two guys, one of whom is played by Adam Driver, the other is played by Michael Zegan for a period of time. There's a lot of discourse about economics and the fact that they are quote-unquote artists, but they are very wealthy and have a lot of financial security that Francis does not. She kind of reckons with the idea of living in New York. She goes home to visit family and really is just the the real word is like wanderlust. 
it almost reminds me of like the work of Wim Wenders. She's just floating through life, making rambunctious and very impulsive decisions that that totally screw her over repeatedly. Yeah, she just sort of ping pongs through like different life events and situations. And at some parts you're like, ah, oh, Francis. And other parts you're like, oh, Francis. But we've all been there. Like, that is what your 20s is. And if you haven't, and, you will be. <laughs> you know, by the end of the story, she is in a fairly good place if she doesn't keep making those kinds of decisions. But throughout the entire thing, all of those opportunities were available to her the entire time if she had made different choices. So you have no confidence that she will, you know, continue to thrive in the way that things are starting to look like they are because <laughs> this, this all could have happened. You know, she had, she has a stable job. She has a nice place to live. These were all available throughout. Because at the beginning of the movie, um, I think like within the first few minutes, she's like with her friend and they're like watching a movie together about to fall asleep. And she says, tell us our story. And they talk about like their big goals about how like she's going to make it as a really famous dancer um, and her friend is going to make it as this great publisher. And the way that throughout the course of the movie, Frances is holding on to that ideal version of her life. And it's only when she kind of like looks around and like realizes that like there are other options or other ways that either you have to live your life or you can live your life that you begin as a viewer to feel like she might make it, she might be okay. She opens up to the idea of choreographing. She gets a stable job and you're kind of like, okay, she's she's let go of that future or she's comfortable with the idea that that future might come later, one or the other. Yeah, which her friend Sophie also has setbacks. You know, she leaves her career in publishing to move to Japan with a guy. It's kind of unclear whether Sophie goes back to her career, but she... Gives us, she expresses a desire to go back. She expresses a regret when she's very drunk that she wishes she had not given up her job and hadn't moved to Japan. Yeah, the, the relationship has bumps in which she expresses some real vulnerability. But you kind of get a sense at the end, at least I felt like they can work it out. Whatever has happened, they will work it out. And she's going to do it while reconnecting with friends that she's like, because she and Francis are kind of out of touch for a large portion of the movie, at least. And in the end, you get a sense that they're going to reconnect. Yeah, because they're no longer at different phases in their life. They're like starting <laughs> to be real adults, quote unquote. <sighs> Which isn't that isn't that like life in your twenties right after right after college? Just like the the imposter syndrome throughout of wondering whether you're doing the right things. Or when will my life begin? When will you your mean? life actually start? <laughs> yeah, I am like just in my first few months after graduating, and I was like, oh my gosh, if at like my early twenties. And only a few months after graduating undergrad, I'm already like relating hardcore to this movie. Where will I be in five years relating to this movie when I'm like actually the ages of the characters? I was like, oh my gosh. As someone who first saw this movie as a sophomore in college when it came out and is now 30, (laughs) man, (laughs) looking down at the characters as younger than me now, I'm just like, Oh, I don't I don't like how much I relate to their insecurity. And I think that's a very human story. <laughs> we all have imposter syndrome. We all make selfish choices because of our own you know inner dread or whatever. And Frances is so relatable because of that. She has like these versions of her future that she wants, and we all have these versions of our future that we want. But then she's like tripping and flopping her way, trying to get to them. And it's just beautiful, but it's so messy as well. And the reason for so much of her pain is she's trying desperately to hold on to her passions and isn't always making, like, practical decisions. She She's very idealistic. And that's often, like, the war that you face or the challenge that you can face, if, especially if you're, like, in creative work or trying to get into creative work. Trying to, like, ride the line between, like, staying true to, like, your passions or your creativities, but also being practical, being realistic, maturing to that. Yeah, the punk movement often talks about selling out. And I think that's a I think that's a term that comes with a lot of weight and problems, but it it, it is very it's it's very it's a nice idea to imagine an artist having that much integrity that they're able to be just themselves and stick to their values and only focus on their art. And the reality is that doesn't pay rent very well unless you have rich benefactors who are willing to subsidize you. Exactly. And I think in Francis's case, it's very ambiguous what happens, but I think for her, she hasn't said goodbye or no to like her passion. She's just found a different way to pursue it. 
and we don't know where her passion's going to take her going she, forward. She finally reached a point where she took opportunities that she thought she was too good for. Yeah. Which let her continue to pursue. So in a way she settled. In a way she settled, but and I but I do think it shows an interesting maturity. I think when you compare like I was thinking about the ending of Ladybird where that character in some ways makes a deeply impractical decision to get as far away as possible, to get to her dream, to get to her dream school or whatever. And it's only after that she gets there that she kind of realizes the consequences and the distance she's gone. Yep. And she's like left to sit with it. And comparing that with Francis, where Francis kind of accepts in a way, settles in a way for that different pursuit of her passions, so to speak. She like settles on it, but it feels more comfortable. Yeah. But not in like, I don't find it uncomfortable, like comfortable in a bad way. It's, she's reached a point of being static. Nothing about the ending feels good here, even though it feels like you're meant to feel good. Yeah. There's also, you know, talk about like her idealism. A lot of this has to do with the idea of friendships. She is hyper obsessed on the state of her friendship with Sophie as they're going through, as we mentioned, like uh, some really rough transitions. Uh, they go months without speaking to each other. They are dishonest with each other. They make choices that are very selfish against each other. They have horrifically bad communication, like within the beginning of the movie where she gets, she breaks up with her boyfriend over moving in with him because she wants to stay with Sophie because she assumes Sophie will stay with her. 10 minutes later. <laughs> and then, spoiler, not everyone has the same life plans. <laughs> not everyone has the same life plans. And you know what they say about assuming. I also think sh she's a little hung up on the idea of quote unquote forever friendships. Absolutely. Which some friendships are forever, but the ones that you, like when you're focused on that friendship being your forever best friend, that's usually a way that you have that friendship actually die because you're not caring for each other and giving each other space and listening. You know, you have this idea of who you're, what a friendship means, but in reality, adult relationships are much more complex. Yeah. Especially like a relationship that started in college and, and when it's much easier to have pro relations by proximity in college, but yeah. when you staple a very, in some ways, kind of rigid title of like best friend forever to someone and then go into adulthood and expect that friendship to stay the same and not except that things are going to change and you have to be flexible with that, you're in for a nasty shock. On the relationship thing, Francis truly is lonely. Throughout this entire movie, I think the common emotion motivating a lot of her actions towards other people can be summed up as loneliness. Yeah, think about the dinner scene where she gets the offer to use the French-like apartment for free. Yeah. And it's just, like, I'm very sensitive to, like, awkward scenes in movies so I was like dying <laughs> during that entire scene, but everything she says- Take the goodwill. Oh my goodness. Everything she says in that scene at the table where she just sort of is like rambling these thoughts about life and love and or also just saying like very bizarre things that your like single friend says at a party and you're like, whoa, bestie, you good fam? It's all coming from like that loneliness- and that desperation for connection. Yeah, she overshares with people she barely knows because she's isolated from her best friend at the time. So she doesn't really feel have a support system to emote with. Exactly. You just get that awkward scene where everybody else at the table is like sort of following the social rules of like politeness. But you can mm -hmm. tell they're all like a little bit, they're out of phase with her and out of step or she's rather out of step with them. I think about that scene a lot. <laughs> The, um, the, the, the director, Sarah Polly described the central theme of the film as penetrating loneliness. I think that's an interesting way to look at it. She's not simply lonely. It penetrates every relationship she has. It penetrates basically every action she takes. That's a really great way of putting it. There we go. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shockingly, Sarah Polly is really good at writing. Kind of makes you think about like when you're a desperately lonely person, even if you are starting to form like friendships and relationships that should help you to feel less lonely, you often have trouble accepting those relationships and behaving normally in those relationships, even if you have those relationships, but you feel, if you feel deeply lonely, like there's that. Yes. It colors the relationship. Even though on paper you shouldn't be lonely, you are. She has other friends, but she's so hung up on the state of this friendship with Sophie that she can't actually treat them properly. Yeah. Well, she's hung up on like that. Yeah. That story of us. We're going to be best friends. Yep. We're going to be successful. We're never going to lose touch. Going to conquer the world together. Exactly. And Sophie actively, you know, tries to move away from this, tries to move on to another stage of life. Yeah. 
And Francis being really rigid and holding tight to her version of the friendship kind of results in them falling apart. Francis is continually rigid in her views of relationships. And then she makes these frenetic decisions um, of basically self-sabotage that push everyone away because they are hard to deal with and they have very real consequences. So she's really her own worst enemy throughout the entire thing, which I think we can all relate to feeling like that. Well, it's so much easier to just self-sabotage yourself and then be like, well, couldn't do it. And not take chances. Exactly. Or even not allow yourself to feel joy. You know, she she burns her credit card on that trip to Paris, which is literally like a weekend trip because she has a inconsequential meeting the following Monday. So she's just kind of a mess. Yeah. And you get the sense when that meeting is introduced to her earlier on by the, I believe it's the, the owner of the company. You can tell as a viewer, that meeting is not going to be, hey, you're going to be a full-time member of the troop. No, she, she, she is so caught up in her delusions that she doesn't have realistic ways of reading what her situation actually is. Yeah. And so like, we all know what's coming when she flies back from Paris, again, from Paris to this meeting, we all know what's going to happen. And that like boot dropping of uh, when the director or the the owner of the company was like, I almost canceled this morning because I had a tickle in my throat. I was like, oh. yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah, like you felt in that moment how inconsequential Francis had been hanging her hat on that this whole time. Yeah, she'd be hanging her hat on it. And she also set aside the ability to reconnect with other friends who were in Paris. She's just stuck grinding gears and hung up on a friendship and a job that are not going to work the way that she wants them to work. There's a really great scene. She, she takes a trip back to Sacramento to visit her family, which Sacramento is a theme in Lady Bird as well. And I, I really love the lens in which Gerwig paints her hometown. It is a calmer, slower, more relaxed space. It, nothing happens in Sacramento. But she is in the bathtub, basically fully submersing herself, experiencing pure escapism. And her mom is knocking on the door asking Francis how much longer, obviously talking about her taking up the bathroom. But the the facial expression and acting Gerwig gives tells you that in that moment, she's having a fully existential crisis. Yeah. And does it's not how much longer are you going to be in this bathroom? It's Francis. How much longer are you until you have your shit together? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That scene in the bathtub where she was like, how much longer are you going to be stuck in this situation that you've built for yourself, when are you going to like let other th- opportunities come in? When will you let your version yeah. of reality meld with other people's? Or in some ways, when will you settle and conform like we all have to as adults? Like being an adult is learning to make compromises. So tragic, but true. Well, maybe not tragic. There are good compromises and then there's other compromises that you can maybe see as negative. I, I don't know how to feel about her compromising at the end because she seems truly satisfied with the work she does manage to do with the choreography. Because she finds fulfillment in it. Exactly. Rather than striving for something that will not work. And in some ways, like, if she's finding joy in it, then I find that in, in many ways a happy ending, even if it's not the reality that she planned for herself. It's not idealized, but it's realistic. Yeah. It's kitchen sink cinema. It's comfortable. It's cozy. I do find it really wonderful how Gerwig, as both a director and actress, uses reactions and facial expressions and physical acting. There are so many moments where Francis in this film, we don't have an inner monologue. We don't have her voicing her thoughts. But she will react to something, either with her face or making an entirely unexpected noise or a physical reaction to what's happening around her, and we immediately connect and know what that character's thoughts on what's happening is. The physicality that she brings, specifically to Francis, is... Intensely reactive. Both with, like, even she's, like, not knocking over chess pieces, trying to, like, play fight with people, or just, like, poses when she sits or stands or walks. There's a moment where a guy starts to move towards physical touch, Mm -hmm. and she is not on the same page, and literally squawks at him just oh, out yeah. surprise Gerwig is constantly performing not just by following the dialogue and the blocking but by putting on a show with her face her hands 
every every element is telling you something about the character's thoughts. And what I love about that is that it it brings a, a natural realness to the characters. It doesn't feel mm-hmm. like a, I'm being quirky and strange just to be not like the other girls or something like that. It's a genuine like she's a fish out of water and she's reacting to what's happening around her in a very in a very realistic way. It adds dimension, realism and depth to a character that already has all of that going for her. What do we think about the fact that she she just consistently loses sight of the actual scope of her circumstances in the joy of the moment? That's often kind of portrayed as a negative thing. Like she's, you know, as we said, self-sabotaging, whatever. But I think there's a certain beauty to the fact that she's able to see that joy, even if it's impractical. Yeah. Even though she's not always, like you said, not in step with what really is her real situation, she does have a a real bounce and happiness to her while at the same time, like the duality of being desperately lonely, but also being like a cheery, happy person in your other moments. Stressed about money at all times, but also living her best life. Exactly. I mean, where she's like running to the David Bowie song, absolute jam. I think that's like probably what people think of when they think of this movie is like that scene. It's an iconic sequence. So great. And I love David Bowie. So I was like, absolutely. (laughs) And the use of music in this movie is very interesting to me because there's like a few songs, um, Bowie and a few other like pop songs, so to speak. And then there's- You don't have a score. There's no score. And then there's a few musical like motifs or ideas that get put in, but it's more like special effect and less so something that's trying to like underscore a scene. It also samples the score from multiple French New Wave films which obviously would be a big influence on mumblecore cinema. There's a lot of commonality there. So it, that that's clearly a nod, and that's interesting to look at. But the soundtrack is often willing to let dramatic moments have no music underneath it, which makes it stand out. Yeah, I really loved the use of music here. It was very like simple, understated, but when it was there, it was great. And when it wasn't there, it was also, it felt intentional. Is there a reason that it's, black and white is the reason the film's not in color well that's that, that's interesting it was made in a very guerrilla style they wanted to be able to move quickly and not and and have very a very small crew and they're shooting with pretty minimal lighting so that does make some things easier the it, this was shot on the first generation of digital slr video cameras so this is really that first wave of movie making using these very small cameras that could put out a very cinematic image the black and white, as a someone who's a professional colorist, is interesting to me because those cameras had really bad dynamic range. So unlike a lot of black and white movies that we think of, there's not really a lot of sparkle or shine to it. It's very flat. It could just be purely a creative choice, or it could be a matter of trying to make the lighting simpler. I don't know. I think it makes it stand out a little bit. It hides some of the flaws of the cameras that they were using. The budget on this movie is very is very low. It was it was made on three million dollars supposedly, but they could have afforded better cameras. I think that choice was entirely built around the size of crew and production that they were able to have. So I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know either. But it, I feel like it works like so well. At no point was I like, "Wow, I wish this was in color." <laughs> Well, it's like, what would color add? You know, it's not Barbie. In photography, we often talk about how you need to have a reason to use color, Mm. at least historically. I can't think of anything that this would add. There's also a certain idealized quality to seeing New York in black and white. It's very romantic. At times, you can almost forget, like, this, this story is very clearly placed in the late aughts. But when... It's very easy to forget it and think, oh, this is the 80s, this is the 90s, this is the 2000s, oh, this is now. Maybe there's a few technical references that don't quite work. Um. No, but it is. It feels very timeless and liminal. In a way, I do, I do think that adds to the sense of floating and disconnectedness that Francis has throughout the movie. Time isn't real. <laughs> P- purely existentialist. Yep, absolutely. At times, the production quality annoyed me. It's just very stripped down. It's interesting because it has that kind of murkiness Mm -hmm. that a lot of festival films that came out around this time all have because of the cameras that they used. The choices that they made as far as the color grading with it being in black and white play to the strengths to make that as unique as they can. It's not a film driven by its aesthetics. So they make choices that allow the aesthetics to fall to the background really nicely. And you can get just lost in the performances. 
you can also just kind of tell that it was a very, very small crew based on how they move about, you know, in, in a variety of very on location settings. I'd be shocked if they had a permit for all the locations in this movie. <laughs> we don't worry about that. <laughs> it's it's all very frenetic. The one thing that I keep thinking about is Frances describes that she likes things that look like mistakes. And I think that's an interesting microcosm of how she goes through this entire film. She brings a appreciation for things that like liking things that look like mistakes, but that doesn't mean that it's a mistake. I like the way she words it. And if you look at her life path, she takes a lot of steps backwards as we would traditionally view things. You know, she goes back to working as basically an RA at her college. She takes a job that's meant for an undergrad student. You know, uh, she goes from being second squad with a dance company to teaching children dancing. She takes a lot of steps back that would not linearly look like progress, but she finds joy in theory. Yeah, they may look like mistakes, but they're not. It's just a non-linear journey. And people are complicated. And I think also we live in a society that's very like, you got to get that success early, kiddo, or you'll miss the train. And I think that undervalues the different experiences that you can collect in your frenetic, non-linear, chaotic 20s that you can then bring to future growth and future opportunities. Don't discount the weird thing that feels like a mistake, but actually may be helpful, impactful, or just like an interesting reprieve. The other aspect is the people who look perfect make plenty of mistakes. Oh, so true. (laughs) Sophie is a mess at the end of this movie. So true. I was like, girl, it's, it's okay. (laughs) But she's, she presents perfectly. She does. And she makes all the correct decisions. Yeah. Like every step of the way. And she's unhappy. Ultimately, they really end up in kind of the same place. Yeah. When she's talking about when she's drunk at in the college dorm room and they're like reliving, you know, after weird drunkenly shouting at a senator. Oh, my gosh. That scene. Uh, uh, Yeah. She's like just a a really quite a stupendous low. And in this weird, you know, parody of college life back in a college dorm drunk dealing with issues of you know abortion access dealing with issues of immaturity in relationships dealing with uncertainty you know they're 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 really they're sharing a they're sharing a single bed in a college dorm and at their most vulnerable and everything is on the table there is no certainty there is no projection it is just laying things out, and they are both equally just a mess. I do find it interesting that there's no consistent male romantic figure for Frances. That's true. I'm trying to think, because she has she has the boyfriend she breaks up with at the beginning. Yep. She goes on a couple awkward dates with Adam Driver. Um, yes. But they never, like, become a relationship. They, 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 don't, they don't work out. She has a friendship that feels like having, you know, when you have a friend and you're like, oh, they're an old married couple. There are sapphic vibes all over this movie. There are very sapphic vibes. One of the first things you hear is, oh, we're like lesbians who no longer have sex. (laughs) Maybe I'm over projecting here, but I feel like every set of like, I don't know, girl best friends have at least once been like, we should just get married. (laughs) And then at the end, she starts dating uh, Michael Zegan's character. And that doesn't feel like it has any sort of like seriousness or purposeness. It's, it almost feels like if you've ever been in a situation where you're like, okay, if we're both single in five years, we're definitely going to start dating. Oh, well, we're still single. Let's give this a whirl. There's no seriousness or it, it, it's not defining her life in any way. It's just another checkbox almost. Yeah, I wasn't even sure that they were dating at the end. I, th- I thought they were alluding to them. He was like undateable, which I was like, oh, that's yeah. a, that's a cute callback. It felt like flirting. It Oh yeah, it absolutely. Like- I was like, that is a, that is a man making a pass, but I, you know, I feel like it was, and I, th- and I think she consciously accepted the pass. I felt like it was ambiguous, but I was like, those two definitely are going on a date later. Yeah, I, I took that as a setup. But what I also liked about him kind of circling back is he early on in the movie is also going through like the same thing. He's paralleling the same things that Francis and Sophie are going through where he's trying to make his career. He's in a different situation because he's like from wealth. So he's not, it's not high stakes. Class plays a, uh, plays a big difference there because they're both trying to figure out their way through the art world, basically. Yeah. 
he has a safety net. <laughs> he has a safety net and he he you know he keeps making he's saying these grand things about like what he's going to do. He's pitching here, he's writing here. He's and borrowing money from his parents. He's borrowing money from his parents and then he kind of because we're following Francis, he drops out of the picture and then he, when he drops back in, he's he's not made it. He's still not doing great as far as you can tell. But he's also not stressed or destroying his life over money because he's not worried about money. Yeah, he's just kind of like undateable. And you're like, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know Adam Driver was in this movie. He was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, baby Adam Driver. He's a little baby. I was, I actually out loud was like, is that Adam Driver? <laughs> this is his fourth role and easily his biggest role of those four. He's doing really well. Driver really has had some interesting performances. I love his performance in Black Klansman. You know, he, he, he always takes interesting roles. I definitely will have to watch more movies that he is in. I'm not really someone who will follow movies because of like the actors they're in, but I would like to see more of his performances. You know, for, for a piece that is so focused on Greta Gerwig's character, Francis, Mm -hmm. it really is driven by being an ensemble piece. And there's a lot of fantastic performances, kind of like how Lady Bird is also heavily, heavily driven by Shirsa Ronan's performance, but it would not be what it is without the amazing supporting cast that we have from Laurie Metcalf, from Timothy Chalamet, from B.D. Feldstein, you know, Lucas Hedges. Gerwig is really good at doing this single focus on a character, but surrounding them with three-dimensional performances that make you feel like it's a lived experience. Considering the fact that we don't Overall, there's really not a lot of screen time for any other character, and we don't ever pivot from Francis's like point of view. You finish the movie feeling like you've built those relationships as well, and also lost them, yeah. but also gained them. Yeah. And that gives you like a weird, I think like zooming out on this movie, I feel like this movie gives a fast reel of what it is like to be falling through your 20s, and it, it leaves you with such an impression. It, Francis could be anyone. This could be anyone's story in a lot of ways. And I think everyone can relate to that story. Yeah. And when you finish, you get this very like real palpable impression of being 20 and not knowing what you're doing and just flip flopping through things. But you're like, okay, like it's a strong feeling. And she's still very much in that place. She's just had a story along the way. Yeah. Next up is Lady Bird, directed by Greta Gerwig. This is her directorial debut. She also was the sole writer on Lady Bird. It also premiered at Telluride in 2012 before being distributed by A24. Yeah, this really went on to be one of the biggest films of the year and made a lot of award splashes. Has a 99% of Rotten Tomatoes. For the first like two months of release, it was at 100% until some, you could call them Rotten Tomatoes, uh, spoiled it by making presumptions about the politics and feminism of the film in bad taste. In the U.S., it's available on Blu-ray from Lionsgate. In the U.K., it's available from Universal. This is a super cheap thing to pick up. Really a nice release. And again, for streaming, it's on Paramount+. Plus. So Christine Ladyberg McPherson is a senior attending high school at a Catholic institution uh, where she is desperately wanting to leave Sacramento, which is her home, and wants to go, quote, to the East Coast where there is culture and excitement and just any everything that Sacramento isn't. And she spends the entire movie trying to clam on to get a hold of, experience things that she views as desirable or cultured or the better versions of life, kind of trying to, you know, just running away from her own like home life um, and her own situation and her own relationship with her mother. And it's just a really beautiful film that portrays like a very complicated mother-daughter relationship, which I love, yep. and also manages to capture a very rich painting of what it can be like to finish out high school, trying to like make your way in the world. And boy, howdy, will you mess up along the way? It's a true coming-of-age film. Uh, Gerwig described this as wanting to make a female counterpart to films like The 400 Blows, Your Boyhood. And I feel that that's really successful here. We see Lady Bird is so focused on wanting to make a name for herself and wanting to have a story that along the way, she almost misses the fact that the events happening in her life are her story. Yeah, she is so checked out on on these important moments in her life, yearning for something else. And that clarity doesn't really, I think, shift in for her until like literally the last five minutes of the movie when she wakes up. Well, she finally gets away from 
her her home and realizes that she loves her home. She loves her family. But that doesn't mean her family's perfect. It doesn't really click for her until she actually gets away from her home and from her family. And it's, she starts to realize how much she loves them and misses them. That does not mean her family are healthy or perfect relationships. Let's talk a little bit about her mom and the maternal conflict in this in this film. Because that really is the dominant relationship going on here. There's a lot of issues of control and generational misunderstanding. But they have a lot more in common than I think either of them would like to acknowledge. They have differing dreams and her mom's dreams for her don't line up with what she wants for her life. But her mom is expecting that Lady Bird will have to settle for a reality, a theme that we can tie into Francis Ha as well. And Lady Bird hasn't realized that pragmatism yet. In many ways, we can probably assume that her mom had to settle for that reality as well. The classic story of the young dreamer versus the pragmatist. The almost hilarious, but most of the time for me, heartbreaking miscommunication that comes from them, both having their like different roles and perspectives constantly like the mom. Oh, I was a beautiful performance. I was like, Laurie Metcalf is amazing. She slayed. <laughs> I was like, I was bawling my eyes out at the end of this movie. Um, her mom is incredibly emotionally immature at times. So immature. In some ways, she feels like a teenage girl picking away at another teenage girl. Yes. Yes. So we have that dynamic of there is a problem of trust. The dad is very level-headed, very practical, and I think he truly understands Lady Bird. And that doesn't mean that her mother doesn't love her. But th there is an imbalance and some harm in the relationship. Lady Bird sums it up to her dad at one point as, well, mom doesn't knock when describing how she knew who was at the door uh, because the father had knocked. You know, that, that speaks volumes to the mistrust and lack of boundaries that exist in that relationship that we can see kind of cascading throughout everything about their interactions. Uh, at some times, Lady Bird really has to be the adult in the conversation. Her mother can be very emotionally manipulative. They never, um, I'm trying to think of like any scene where they actually like have a conversation where they come out of it in a good place and they don't ever like now I'm thinking about it I was like because she lives the voicemail but that's a voicemail that's not a conversation we end with they are so unable to communicate their feelings to each other in a healthy way that you know at the end of the film her mother has been trying to write out her thoughts about going to college for Lady Bird and has been failing to reach something satisfactory to herself so she just abandons it and leaves Lady Bird at you know not even getting out of the car at the airport feeling basically abandoned when she actually had deep, powerful th feelings about Lady Bird going on into this next next phase of life, leaving for college. It, it's a deeply broken relationship. It is, and I it echoes so many, like, real-life relationships. Just the inability to articulate your feelings for another person and shrouding that in, in any reason to not express those feelings. Like, at the end, when her father is, like, Talking to her and he's like, well, she was worried you like, nitpick at the spelling or you critique this, that or the other. And it's like, it's clear this, this, her mom just was looking for any reason to not make herself vulnerable because that's what she was doing in writing those letters. Lady Bird has voiced that she is very critical of her mother in their one-on-one -on -one relationships. That is like a valid fear because her mother has lost scope of what, what her letter actually meant. Yeah. Which was validating Lady Bird, being pr showing that she's proud of Lady Bird. Private versus public interaction is an interesting dynamic. We, we, they fight continuously throughout this movie, yet Lady Bird repeatedly defends her mother in public situations. So th they are a unified front in some ways. They are. No one bad mouths my mother except for me. There is also like some like transactional relationship stuff. Uh, her mother repeatedly brings up like everything we do for is for you. You cost us a lot of money. And Lady Bird is just like, it, it's a parental responsibility to raise your child. And Lady Bird's kind of fed up with that. And there's a lot of teen angst, but it's also just not handled very well. It's really heartbreaking. The scene where her mother, again, to go into that like transactional thing where her mother's talking about how much they've sacrificed for Lady Bird. And she's like, give me a number. And one day I'll make a lot of money and I'll pay you back. And in that moment, her mother decides to take like the, I'll take you out of the kneecaps way out. She takes, she just says like, I doubt you'll ever make enough money. You know, you'll wind up in jail or, yeah. You know. Which is such a weird thing to say to your kid, especially the kid that you're trying to, like, encourage to go to a college 
and do something with her life. Because she later, another person movie is like, I want you to be the best version of yourself that you can be and things like that. It's her own insecurity projecting yeah. onto how and she it's, treats Lady Oh, Bird. that scene just wrecked me. She just cops out with the, like, you'll never amount to that. So like, why would I bother giving you a number? Yeah. It, it's also like generational trauma of being stuck in compromising situations. Yeah. I think another part of that is the timing. This this film is set in 2002, and this film is so 2002. Everyone's dealing with post-9-11 trauma. That it, it just kind of, it's only mentioned a few times, but it hangs over the entire thing. You know, the, the evasion of Iraq is definitely an event that's ha- about to happen and comes up at a couple, couple points. The economic recession that we saw post-9-11. But I also think it's very clear that her mom is a baby boomer. And there's a lack of communication skills that her mother has that are very generational. Lady Bird is solidly Gen X and is able to, you know, express herself in ways that her mother simply can't relate to. Yeah. And also going back to 9-11 just happening, Lady Bird is entering into adulthood in a very, just a very different world than then her mother grew up in, and and she doesn't have the same, like, it is a new world in many ways. And the fear the, that her mother expresses is in, in, in many ways, like, a justifiedly understandable fear because everything was insane. Yeah. Her father loses her job and isn't able to find them. Her older sibling has a college degree from Berkeley and is struggling. They're all kind of trapped by, in their class by the economy just screwing them over. So there's no certainty for anyone. So why should Lady Bird have dreams? This was something I struggled with kind of at the end of the movie. When Lady Bird gets into her school, her dream school, and her parents in many ways move heaven and earth to get her there. Even though her mother doesn't talk to her the whole time and you're like dying emotionally because of that. Yeah. Her parents somehow find a way financially to at least send her to her like freshman year of college and it doesn't click in for her after being waitlisted it doesn't click into place for her like what her parents have done for her the sacrifices until she gets there yeah but i'm a very pragmatic practical person myself and part of me was like parents why did you do that and then i was thinking about it even more and i was like when you love your child so blindly but can't articulate to them how much you love them you would refinance your house and send them away to their dream school while still like not telling them that you believe in them. Another aspect of this being post 9-11 is the interest rates are the lowest they've been in American history at this point in time. So, you know, they probably should have been refinancing their house anyway. <laughs> but yeah, no, they, they took extreme risk. I'm just, that's a lot of... Uh, to make her dreams happen. Like a lot. They sent her across the country yep. <laughs> to a prestigious school yes and i don't think she's truly appreciative of that even at the end she's appreciative of where she came from more but i don't think she truly understands sacrifice yeah i do love that she uses her given name christine at the end yeah let's talk about that motif so in one of the first scenes of the film she introduces herself at a school assembly as ladybird yeah and she's constantly manip- like changing her name on registries and signs and things to say ladybird anytime she can disregard or or throw away christine she does why do you think that is i mean i took it as a sort of a teenage attempt at like individuality at the same time also yeah rejecting her mother, or at least I think she sees it as a rebellion against her mother because it's a it's a name given to her by her parents. I feel like it's heavily implied that her mother named her. She's also super fixated on the idea of culture and everything. In her view, everything from Sacramento is plain and doesn't have the gravitas that she you know considers like the great writers of, the, of New England or whatever. So I think a part of that is also wanting to distinguish herself away from Sacramento itself. Yeah. And why wouldn't the place where you grew up be a place that to you represents boredom and shackles and normality? Not to use the cliche, the grass is always greener, but she has, she paints herself this, this alternative life and what a wonderful place it would be to go to the East Coast to go to school because what you grow up with was, is what you're used to. And 
also talking again about like financial with her parents constantly stressing about making ends meet and constantly she's being told she needs to choose what she would view, choose down, choose like the local city college. Be practical. Be practical. And having that constantly like told to you, you can see where the rebellion and the desire to get away and just completely call like everything that she's come from be mundane, you know? Yeah. But she's also like told she's mundane repeatedly. Her her mother borders on body shaming at times with how she describes Lady Bird's physical appearance when they're shopping for clothes or, you know, discussing her going to prom. It, it, it's kind of shocking. And judges her like tastes in color and things like that. Like, um, yes, I think about the scene where Lady Bird comes out in the like bright pink dress that she looks very good in. And she's like, I love it. And her mom goes, is it too pink? Which is I think it's a wonderful piece of dialogue because her mother's not being like, oh, well, I don't like it. But she's saying, well, I don't like it. She's she's also saying, are you too much? Yeah. Are you too much? And it's such like a, such a manipulative, like parent thing to say. It it sows that doubt in Lady Bird. It does. And that's all it takes for Lady Bird to just turn around and be like, well, and then she's like, do you like me? And her mom's like, well, I love you. And she's like, that's not the same thing. And you're like, damn. Yep. You know, as much as Lady Bird is just like that obnoxious high school high school philosopher, she also is truly profound at moments. Truly profound and very human. And though for most of the movie, I was like, girl, get it together. It's not that deep. At the same time, like you feel for her, you sympathize and you empathize with her and you want her to like make it yep. in a weird way. But then she makes it. You're rooting for her. You're rooting for her. And then when she makes it, you are left feeling kind of empty because she has kind of damaged pretty much all of her relationships to get there. The, the only hope you really walk away with is that she realizes what how good she had it. But she's now, you know, 3,000 miles away and very much having to start again. I thought it was interesting that she comes to that realization right after a extremely like stereotypical college party that you could have. At any college. Yeah, she gets blackout drunk and realizes she doesn't have her mom to hold her. Exactly. And she like walks out and she's like, what day is it? And for half a second, because this is my 2023 brain, I was like, how does she not know what day it is? And then I was like, oh, it's 2002. Like, you might not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you don't have a smartphone to tell you. Sorry, showing my age here. But again, like, I kind of laughed because she like goes to this school with her dream of her idealized future of like culture and learning and like whatever. And the first thing she does is go to like do a thing that you could do at any college, which is just get blackout drunk, try to make out with someone and then vomit on the floor. And I was like, well, crucially, barely avoiding doing both at the same time, making out and vomiting. One of the other kiddos, not both. But she, she feels real vulnerability and she's On her own in New York City, a year after the deadliest terrorist attack in America hit a few blocks away from where she's living. Which I feel like it bears saying it's a other reasonable fear that her mother has is her going to like New York. Oh, yeah. We touched on this like vaguely, but I do say like it's very reasonable that her mother is afraid for her to go be in New York. I worked in near the trade centers 20 years after the 9-11 attacks and my mother had a heart attack regularly over that. Yeah, like the the trauma and the fear cannot be understated of like, you know, someone near and dear to you going, especially like only a year afterwards, going to New York. That's still your little kid. You're still afraid for them. And for it to be New York after 9-11, no less, like that's a very understandable fear. And even before 9-11, New York was a big city. And this is before, you know, we really saw like the Giuliani effect fully take effect of quote unquote cleaning up New York. Uh, that, That we can, that's controversial. But New York was very rightly perceived as being a big, dangerous, scary place. And like every parent I've met, like my parents freaked out about me going to college 30 minutes away. Like you're going to be protective of your kid no matter where they go. If they're going across the country, literally. To a massive city where they know no one. Like honestly, like I'm scared for Lady Bird. And we don't even know what happens to her after the end of the movie. Let's talk about war. The invasion of Baghdad happens the spring of her senior year of high school. And it's not directly discussed we see it in news clips and it pops up in awkward conversations with boys that she is experimenting with and it's interesting because it it permeates so much the idea of war 
permeates so much of the way culture is is portrayed. But it doesn't seem to really really seem to bounce off Lady Ladybird. She's she has feelings, she has thoughts, but she's also able to live her life. You know, she says different things can be sad. It's not all war. She's able to detach from the direct circumstances around her in a way that I find really interesting. Yeah, I kind of read that to be her kind of like protecting herself. Like unpacking it would be painful. Yeah. Like it is easier to in many ways be selfish and focus only on myself and what I want because zooming out and unpacking what has happened is too difficult and too painful and I'm also 17. Also, I thought it was very interesting because she gets into this relationship with like another actor I forgot was like in this movie slash didn't know. Timothy Chalamet, a wild Timothy appears. Yes. And mostly conversations with him because he's like this pseudo intellectual, like, you know. He's the high school kid who's done a bunch of drugs and considers himself to be the next great philosopher. He's he's that and wise and sad, everyone. deep boy that you fall for in high school. One of the first lines he has is he he says, good on you for not having a cell phone. You know, they're government tracking devices, which are like, that is so 2002, but also, wow, so predictive. <laughs> So predictive. He was like, we all take our tracking chips, give it time. And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> all right, sir. Sit back down with your history. What was it? Uh, a People's History of the United States or something was what he was reading. He's reading 16-year-old Kyle's favorite nonfiction book, A People's History of the United States. <laughs> you know, he is a walking stereotype. Who doesn't realize he's a walking stereotype? I thought it was very funny. Um but like, great at the same time. But what I was going to say was like, Lady Bird doesn't really get into any like deep discussions with him. It's all like yeah. surface level. The comments he makes, the comments she makes. And then they get into a very physically driven relationship that still has no substance. Yeah. It feels like it means nothing to him. And to her, I don't even know what it means. Like she's she's chasing after a materialistic kind of ideal of she wants to lose her virginity with someone else who's also losing their virginity for the first time. She has this like perfect picture of what her story is going to be. Yep. And he was not invested, lies to her about it. She wants to have the John Hughes experience. And then it's a reality check where it's like, you don't get that. Yeah, he, he, he lies and says that he's also a virgin. They have very sloppy sex. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's, ah. it's painful. It's painful. And she's talking about the ideal, her ideal of what her first time would be like. And then he, you know, drops the bomb that he's not actually a virgin and he's actually slept with quite a few people. Which I laughed at that part where he was like, oh, yeah, like five or six. And I was like, did you, though? Or are you just trying to sound cool? Because I can't tell right now. But he names them. He names them. It's a crushing reality check in relationships for, for Lady Bird. Because this meant a lot to her. It didn't feel like she thought it would. And then she has the confirmation because she was lied to. Constantly in this movie, she falls in and out of friendships and relationships that impact her and shape her story. She doesn't know that, but they do. But at the same time, so many of them are very like surface level. Her relationship with Kyle is so, again, on paper, she's the young philosopher. She's dating the young, hot, moody philosopher boy and it ultimately he thinks he's better than everything thinks he's better than everything everyone thinks he's like the coolest thing since sliced bread and it's just a very like empty unfulfilled thing though like when it's done i think that relationship though is a really good parallel for the entire movie because throughout this entire film she is intensely idealizing what high school is meant to be what the process of coming of age is meant to be in some ways it's a coming of age movie about coming of age and then it's unfulfilling and unspecial. You know, there, there's that great line when they're having that whole conversation about virginity where he says, you will have so much unspecial sex in your life. And it's just like a reality check of this isn't special. Yeah, it's like when you're like, this is what happens when people watch only coming of age movies before they finish high school and they just assume it's going to be the same. It's, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be no. Ferris Bueller or insert any other coming of age movie of your choice. I mean, I, I think the I think the sexual politics of the film parallel a lot of things there. I mean, Lady Bird has that quote where she says, "I really like dry humping much more than fucking," and that's the moment where I think she she identifies that romance and sex are two different things, and she's disappointed in the sex because <laughs> the romance wasn't the dream that she had. I do think it's interesting that. Her second relationship in the movie is basically 100% physical, but the first relationship she has in the movie is so emotional. A deep emotional connection. Ah! Which winds up not panning out because dishonesty, again, he is lying to her because he's gay. I'm really glad that they had a conversation later in the movie and they, like, make up because... 
I was very worried that Danny, they would not make up and it would just be like hanging over the whole movie. And, and then it's fine. It's totally fine. But that that was a thing that happened and it sucks for her, but it's also his story at that moment. He does what's good for her his life the interesting like the deep emotional like she's she's in love with him as far as i can tell yeah totally smitten it's totally smitten reality check it doesn't work out the relationship and then she immediately sort of flip-flops into this emotionally unfulfilling physical relationship where you know you could argue that she takes away important things from both of the relationships but also she takes damage away from both of the relationships too Oh, she's really affected by that. Yeah. Another character that I see a really interesting parallel to is the connection between Father Leverich and Lady Bird, because they are both, in many ways, idealists. The difference is, obviously, Father Leverich is quite a few years older than her. Uh, I'd say he's probably nearing middle age. And really great performance by Stephen McKinley Henderson. He's the theater director at the high school. He is a Jesuit priest. And like a lot of parts of Jesuit education, it's very clear that he has a lot of cultural education. He knows the arts. He knows great works. He knows history. And he's doing these very elaborate black box theater productions that just his audience and students are not on the same level of understanding the material as he is. They are not cultured. They are not engaging with the material in a very informed way and it's unsatisfying for him and he's just kind of going through the motions trying his best to make this make this meaningful to find joy in the in these arts that he's pursuing to be very much like ladybird to be notable he's in a cycle of basically depression and unhappiness he actually has to take a some time away from his students and his art to seek mental health uh, crisis counseling we kind of get a little glimpse of what could be ladybird's future it's interesting because the scene where he's he's taking time away and he ends up talking to, to Lady Bird's mother. Yeah, who's a nurse at the psych ward. Yeah, she's a nurse at the psych ward. And he's like, don't tell your daughter about this. And so I, I don't even know if Lady Bird ever truly, really knows what's going on with him. But you, the viewer, are given like this. I'm sure there were rumors. Oh, for sure. And I think a character even, she's like talking, she's talking rumors about like his, how difficult his life was before he started at the school there. Yeah. And then she just sort of walks away like it's nothing. And so, like, I'm sure Lady Bird had, like, a notion of it. But I think, like, the viewer is given way more of a notion of, like, this is what she could be. And this might be what she's running from. Because she only starts theater, like, that year. She's trying to redefine herself. A vowed sister at the school kind of sees that she's a fish out of water struggling to find a way to strike out an identity and suggests theater to her. It's not something she takes to particularly well. What is a better way to help someone find their identity than the theater? I'm just kidding. This nun sees her and identifies that Lady Bird is not special. She's got a dreamer. She's got a lot of talent. But this this is an archetype that we've seen before and is able to be like, you need an outlet, kid. You need to figure out what you're doing. If you want to make your dreams happen, you're going to have to work harder. But also you need an outlet. And she's able to direct Lady Bird towards that outlet. Yeah, I think when we when we were talking about Frances Hall, we were talking about like mistakes that you make, um, yeah. and like missing on opportunities that are offered to you. Yep. And the way Lady Bird just sort of like she kind of throws herself into the theater the first semester, but the second semester she just doesn't come back. She's finally starting to hang out with the rich kids that she wishes she was. There's a lot of class jealousy throughout this this entire film. Well, she's also, she's getting what she thinks she needs or what she wants, but she's ignoring what she needs, so to speak. She's also dishonest to them, so she screws up those relationships as well. Uh, she lies about her class. In every single one of these movies, there were a sim scenes where I was like, oh my gosh, and that was the friend that she's worked so hard to build this, like, in, in many ways, like, just a very faux relationship. Like, it's not real. And the girl's like, I can't tell how invested she's in in this friendship, but she goes to her house or what she thinks is her house, but it's actually Danny's grandmother's house that is like this beautiful. Yeah, the idealized house that Lady Bird has always wanted. Yeah, and and then you're like, and then it all comes tumbling down because then she learns that she doesn't live there and their friendship completely dissolves. And you kind of are left to wonder if they could have formed the friendship in the first place if Lady Bird hadn't like lied. I, I think they could have. I think they could have. She genuinely liked Lady Bird, and there's just so much damage done by the lie. Absolutely. And because 
Also, if Lady Bird's going to translate all of her relationships through an aesthetic lens of, like, wealth and culture and such, then, like, she's going to have a hard time having relationships. And we're left with an unsatisfying conclusion because, you know, throughout this entire time, she's lying to people about being from the neighborhood that she's from. She's lying to people about the finances or circumstances. And then when she gets to college, she lies and says she's from San Francisco. So this is not something that's resolved. She hasn't learned her lesson. She's making new friends on false promises. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that with San Francisco. I thought that the guy she was speaking to didn't know where Sacramento was. No, she says Sacramento, and he says, I'm sorry. Like, he didn't quite hear her. Uh-huh. And then she says San Francisco. Ah. Oh. She she makes a choice in that moment to deceive him. Yeah, and to not be like, Sacramento, California. Look at a map. The capital. <laughs> She's so, like, when we talk about, like, protagonists that are, you know, in many ways quite unlikable, she has, on paper, like, very few, I think, like, redeeming qualities throughout the movie. Like, she is the classic, like, bratty teenager who's striking out, trying to figure themselves out. And you're rooting for her in a lot of ways because you're like, ah, she is but a youth and she will figure it all out. But at the same time... Because we've all been there, but she's such... She's so relatable, but she's such a little, like, ah, like... Just, like, stealing magazines from the store, throwing away the math teacher's grade book, like... All these things where it's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? She has such bold hopes and dreams that you can't help but love her. It's also hard to dislike a character played by Saoirse Ronan. Yes. She's just so... uh. Yes. I mean, as much as I love Atonement, Atonement definitely challenges that. But yes. (laughs) The other aspect is people call her on her problems. And that's, that's something that makes her character tolerable because we see people acknowledging her flaws and pointing them out to her. And she's reacting to that. Most frequently her mother, but you also see, you know, her older, her older brother points out that something, she, something she says about his college experience, uh, th- they're half siblings and he's of mixed race. Uh, while she is white, he, he points out that she's basically incredibly racist in how she presents something. And there's a real, like, check yourself moment that is very relatable to being a teenager and saying things without thinking things through or having the world experience to understand what you're saying or having, you know, not being able to understand your own racial bias. Again, going back to this idea of, like, she doesn't, she doesn't have any perspective on what she has and has, does not have. And she's constantly thinking about what she does not have pretty much until, like, pretty much the whole, pretty much the end. Like, you, the viewer, know but you don't really know if she knows yet. She's starting to realize both what she had and what she's lost because of her actions, and also starting to realize the privilege that she does have. Back to just kind of like a portrait of the time. One thing I think about is we talk about like the rise of participation trophies in this era. You know, every, every everyone gets an award. Everyone gets, everyone gets something. And she feels unfulfilled in the theater role because there are literally roles being made up to ensure everyone has a part. So I think that's one reason she loses passion in theater is because it's not real. She understands it's not significant and that she's just filling, you know, just being there, not actually welcome there. Yeah, definitely. And I also, it kind of makes me wonder because when we talk about like trying to find direction, trying to find passion, trying to find something to do, is she doing theater because she likes theater? Is she doing theater because she wants to be something and theater is going to help her be something? Or because she was told to do it. Or because she was told to be there. Yeah. I think it's very funny the like the amount of adults in Lady Bird's life who don't mean her any harm, but also are like crushingly realistic at times. You're like, oof, like the counselor where who's like, you're not going to get into these colleges like with your grades. It's realism versus idealism. Just brutally real. That's a very interesting angle. And in many ways, in that time, the cynicism feels natural. It feels very realistic to this kind of post-9-11 dread that everyone has. Nothing good can happen. And Lady Bird is the sole person standing out against that. Yeah, and I think like when you're seeing it from Lady Bird's perspective you get a lens, you feel because you're rooting for her that the adults are like against her. But when you look at it, like kind of categorically, they're just trying to be realistic, but because, but this is through like the eyes of a teen and the 
point of view and the like everything that comes with the like, coming of age, you can see it as antagonistic, as a force against. Speaking about realism, let's transition on to our final film of the day, Barbie. <laughs> I haven't processed this movie. I think I need to watch it like another four times. Same. I've seen it twice and it's wow. More colorful than the first two. It sure is more colorful. It also really shows director Greta Gerwig stretching her legs in a way that Lady Bird and Little Women didn't quite allow her to because, you know, Lady, Lady Bird and Little Women are both these, like, derived from Mumblecore, very interpersonal dramas, and they're wonderful. Barbie allows Gerwig to show off just how well-educated in the language of cinema she is. There is so much going on in this movie. It is directed by Greta Gerwig, as I mentioned. It is written by her and Noah Baumbach, her partner. This is probably the biggest movie of the year. I doubt anything else can top it. It opened massively on July 21st alongside Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, which obviously a lot of people went to go see that as the weirdest double feature ever through Barbenheimer. It made oodles of money. How'd it do on Rotten Tomatoes? It got an 88%, which makes sense. Yeah, when you actually read the reviews, the negative reviews all seem to be a little hyper fixated on the messaging and on the, the the platform that Gerwig is using. Yeah, and also the huger the movie, the harder it is for like a percentage to stay like at the top because that's just how it works. And this was a huge movie. I People are going to be talking about this for years. And it's available worldwide on 4K Blu-ray from Warner Brothers and you can rent it anywhere. It is not on any subscription video service yet. What do we even say about this movie? I feel like this could be its own just like episode, but... But we got to stick with the, like the three movie per episode theme, so we can take yeah. a stab. Um, I love the beginning of this movie so much. The two thousand one uh, spoof. Oh my gosh! I and, and she's winking at you the entire time because she assumes you're intelligent and knows cinema, so she knows you're going to connect that with two thousand one, and then deconstructs every element about that. I love how self aware this movie is, while at the same time being insane we have you know references to wizard of oz that are that are intelligently baked into the idea of going between worlds and all that uh we have a musical number in the style of jacques demi we have you know uh, the kind of machoism that we associate with something like saturday night fever you have amazing amazing set design in the style of the red shoes you you have a matrix reference you have a shining reference there is so much of the language and history of cinema sprinkled in throughout this movie and yet unlike you know a lot of ya movies that we've seen over the last few years these you know it's not sarah what is that book that everything is like 80s movie references that was huge oh my gosh the book that i hate ready player one yes thank you It's not Ready Player One where it's continuously going, oh, did you notice that? Did you notice that? Did you notice that? It's intelligently using these references to build a language of cinema that we understand innately by being media consumers. It doesn't talk down to its audience. And it's just, and if you don't get those references, like it's not going to impact your enjoyment of like the film itself. No, because it's still delightful. Because it's still delivering on its own merits. Unlike Ready Player One, Catch Me on Goodreads, hating on that book. Sorry. It also doesn't take itself seriously. The narrator multiple times just interjects to poke fun at itself. You know, literally being like, yeah, if we're going to talk about like self-image, maybe Margot Robbie is not the actress we want to use to, to as an example here, you know? I loved the narrator portion. Sometimes I feel like using a narrator in films can be like a little trite. It's cliche. But I found it so funny here where it's just like, note, using Margot Robbie is not the best choice for getting this point across. And you're just like... The narrator's Helen Mirren. Like, how could you not love it? No, I I love this movie. I'm going to rewatch it this week again. It's great. Yeah. It's... We should probably describe what the movie is (laughs) in case you haven't heard. (laughs) If you haven't seen it already, in which case, go watch it. It's still apparently in some movie theaters. It can be found for those who are willing to try. Um, Two weeks ago, I was with your sister at at a very small Regal in Raleigh, North Carolina, and it was still playing in like late September 2023. This movie has had legs. It's going far, and I'm sure it will be like people are going to do like flashback viewings of it in film theaters like oh yeah repertory cinema is gonna love it's this gonna They're, like it's gonna be again i will be going to see it in theaters 
I like that it explains things to you about the world. Yeah, it tells you what it's doing. It tells you what you need to know. And then it's like, but don't worry about the rest. When the guy's like, so is Barbie land like Switzerland or like in your imagination? No, it's Barbie land. And they're like, it's just Barbie land. it, (laughs) It sets up this idea that the Barbies, the toys Barbie, Barbie, Ken, Alan, are all living in this idealistic utopia where it's a matriarchal society that has achieved, at least in their opinion, social justice. And they are totally happy. In fact, they are so happy that they are conformist in agreeing that they are happy. Everything is perfect. And there's no interaction with the quote-unquote real world, which is where the girls who are given Barbie dolls are playing with them and looking up to them while the reality is this is our real world. You know, things are not that kind of utopia. And we're, we're very aware from an immediate standpoint that Barbie's world is fake. She does not have real food or drink. The waves that they're surfing on are not moving. Everything about it is a child's plaything. And I think this is a really interesting lens to look at because the movie is entirely self-aware as opposed to something like, say, G.I. Joe, where it it fully buys into the realism of the children's play. Barbie is entirely aware throughout and reminding you that this is not reality. But then it's able to use that absurdism to comment on the real world. And also, in a move that's really brave for a movie that is made by Mattel, comment on the flaws of the brand itself. Yeah, I didn't expect the movie to come as hard as it did for pretty much everything that it did because I didn't, I know really anything about the movie before watching it. Did you have Barbie dolls as a kid? I did not, actually. I did not play with Barbie as a kid, but I... I probably play with more Barbie dolls than you then. Yeah, you probably have. It's very funny. I laughed at the beginning because the baby dolls that the girls were playing with before like they eat them into the sunset. Mm Mm-hmm. Those were like more like the toys that I played with as a kid. Yeah, the traditional, you know, little, you know, the little baby, literally baby dolls, which the whole thing is in the late 50s when Barbie hit the scene. She was not a baby. She was a, you know, grown ass, glamorous woman. She was different. And I asked my mom about this, actually. And she was like, well, I my mom never liked Barbie because she felt like she had very like unrealistic body proportions, which is. Yeah, she did. Critiqued (laughs) on in the movie. Um in the scene where, like, the daughter, it, like, just eviscerates Barbie, um, followed by, I think, one of the funniest lines in the film where she has, like, an existential, existential crisis. She's, like, sitting on the curb going, like, I'm not a fascist. I can don't don't control the um, railways or the means of commerce. And it's just really funny because if you knew any, like, edgy, I'm not like the other girls in, like, middle school, all the things that that girl says to Barbie is, like, what people who think they like are cool and deep critique Barbie for. It's also like dealing with like a very textbook understanding of fascism. It's like, Oh, well, you know, you know, Mussolini has achieved, uh, achieved control through, you know, taking over the markets and take, and, you know, forcing the railroads to operate under one control. The, the brand criticism that happens is the movie has this through line of what Barbie has come to mean in pop culture and what Barbie aspires to mean as a brand. And I think that's really interesting because it is intensely critical of what Barbie has become and what Barbie represents while also painting a really glowing idea of what it could be. And for like, this is basically sponsored content. Like this is, this is a film that promotes a toy. That is ultimately the end game here. You know, they've hired an incredible artist, artistic team to make it, but that is what this movie is. So that's kind of shocking. It is, but in some ways, I think it's one of the most brilliant marketing moves ever. Because when you think about like, this is a bit of a weird example, but bear with me. A critique that I see a lot of people like level towards like dialogue and Marvel movies is the fact that they will call out their problems with the movies with like some kind of mm-hmm. quippy one liner um, instead of actually like addressing that plot issue and doing something about it. And it kind of dismisses it. Yeah. It feels dismissive. But what Barbie does is it is like, yeah, we got some problems, but like, this is what we could be. And it's so self-aware and it's okay. And, and, and the movie presents it as comfortable with critiquing itself. But like, yep. I came out of that movie 
And I didn't feel negatively toward Mattel. In fact, I was like, dang, Barbie's kind of cool. As someone who didn't play with Barbies, I was like, I kind of appreciate Barbie in a way that I didn't before. So I do think it is like one of the most brilliant like marketing moves ever because people are going to, I think, walk away with the idealized version of Barbie. So Barbie is a Barbie girl living in her Barbie world and life is fantastic. And she is, it is, I think, one of the best openings to a film. She is living on cloud nine, floating through, like, picture the most plastic, perfect, pink world you can. That's yep. the world. And this movie is, like, to the nines. Like, no expense and no outrageous set piece was spared. Truly stunning production design. And almost all of it is directly referential to actually actual Barbie pieces throughout history. They know the Barbie lore. They took it seriously. Yes. This was some this was some deep cuts. And they even like highlight the deep cuts later on. Um, but they're so not real that like their their feet literally are always pointed and their hair is yes. always perfect. And their skin is actually like kind of plasticky, like no skin problems no in blemishes. sight. No Nothing. blemish. Perfection. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's kind of hard to kick existential dread, apparently, because Margot Robbie's uh, generic Barbie, sorry, stereotypical Barbie, begins to have thoughts of death. And it's very funny because they're all like having this massive dance party. And then she's like, do you guys ever think about death and everything like freezes? And then she's like, yep. I'm dying to get back on this dance floor or something like that. And it's just like. People don't have problems in this world and her character starts to understand problems. Yeah. She starts to have bad breath and her feet go flat and she has cellulite developing. And her toast is burnt and it doesn't land on the plate perfectly and her butter hits the counter. Her milk is spoiled. Her milk is spoiled. It's tragic. And so then she's told that she's like malfunctioning and she has to go see Weird Barbie. A Weird Barbie is a Barbie doll that's been played with too much. Someone who's a little disfigured by children loving her too much. Her hair's been chopped up. Brilliantly playing by, played by Kate McKinnon. Oh my gosh, she's great. Yeah, so she's like, picture every doll you've ever seen where like the kid has drawn on makeup, cut the hair, put in highlights with like a marker, given her like a new outfit that didn't like come with the doll. Or made one. <laughs> yeah, it's like a homemade, like, I made this out of a sock. It's great. Anyway, and she's, like, this elder who is, her, like, job in society is to, like, help Barbies be perfect. And she goes, and she gets her, like, inciting quest incident. This reminded me of, like, fantasy movies where, like, the sage character is like, you must go and find your destiny far afield. Like, you know. It's literally the hero's journey. It is the hero's journey. And then they make fun of the Matrix along the way. Like, yeah. <laughs> You, the Birkenstock high heel choice. Uh, yes. And, and then the acknowledgement that's a false choice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, no, you have to take the Birkenstock. And yeah. And then Barbie goes to the real world, but she doesn't go alone, Kyle. Who does she go with? Ken stows away in her convertible, which Ken and Barbie's relationship at this point is really very cliche you know it's that it, it's that stereotype of the kid who oh oh barbie and ken they love each other make them kiss with no actual understanding of what a relationship is or sex there's a line pr prior to this where ken is like can i sleep over tonight and barbie's like yes and do what and ken goes i don't know you know it, it, it's a, it's all very surface level but barbie uh, but ken knows that his sole purpose for existing is to be with barbie so he follows Barbie, where he's not really welcome, but Barbie reluctantly agrees to go along. And where do they show up? Where is the height of culture to have their first experience in the real world after going through a bunch of very amusing steps to get there? They arrive in Venice Beach, where they stand out like crazy. And Barbie starts to understand that the matriarchy that she's used to is not reality in the real world they haven't achieved equity i would argue whether equity is what they've achieved in barbie land i think the film makes it quite clear that that's not the case but she starts to understand that it is a man's world you know you see male dominated careers and then you have an incident of groping which shocks barbie and she you know immediately 
assaults the guy back and they get their first arrest. And then they are let go after being essentially catcalled by the, by the police officers. And they go get new clothes because that's what Barbie dolls do. They get new clothes. Uh, no concept of money. So guess what? They get arrested again. And we just kind of see them trying to discover like what is the real world. Barbie has had a vision. She knows from Weird Barbie that she has to go connect with the girl. She knows the high school that she's going to to connect with the girl that she thinks is the girl who's playing with her, Sasha. While she's seeking that out, Ken goes and learns about the world. He learns that it is a great world to be a man in. And he learns about patriarchy. He's pretty sure it's mostly to do with men riding horses. So he's got some... If only. He's got some... (laughs) If only. (laughs) If only. (laughs) I mean, there's even a moment where he's like applying for jobs. He has no qualifications. He is a doll. And he has this, you know, rudimentary understanding of patriarchy. And the guy he's applying for the job with is like, after, after Ken explains how he thought things would be, he would like, oh, no, we have patriarchy. We just make it look like we don't. So that's very like self-aware portrayal of the state of our world. Very self-aware, but it also had me wheezing when he was like at the doctor's and he was like, can I speak to a doctor? And the lady was like, well, I am a doctor. And he was like, can you get me a cup of coffee? And she was like, no, get out. Like, yeah, he was just trying out. <laughs> can I just perform one operation? Can I perform an appendectomy? And she's like, no. He has no understanding of how the actual world works because he lives in make-believe. No thoughts, just Ken. And it's great. And on the other hand, Barbie meets with her supposed, you know, child that's supposed to love her and play with her, Sasha, who is a very socially aware teenager who has long outgrown Barbie dolls and puts Barbie in her place regarding, in her views, how Barbie is regressive and harmful to women and superficial. And this really shocks Barbie. We later find out that her mother is actually working as a designer at Mattel and has been the person who has been drawing up these really offbeat and unflattering ideas for Barbie dolls. You know, existential dread Barbie doll, Barbie doll who has cellulite, Barbie doll who has flat feet. And this is the person who's actually been playing with Barbie. And all of this kind of comes to a head as... Mattel is attempting to locate the Barbie who has escaped from Barbie Land and put her back in her toy box to be remanufactured and sent back to Barbie Land. So we we wind up in this kind of crazy chase scene where there's a lot of information dumped on us and Barbie is able to bond with Sasha's mother, Gloria, and begin to click on their common goal and understand how things have gone screwed up. So, in an attempt to escape from Mattel, they return to Barbie Land to be able to demonstrate to Sasha what Barbie, what Barbie really is all about. But there's a problem. Ken hit the books, which, side note, nothing, like, this was so not meant to bug you, but it bugged me. He just walks into a library, picks up a bunch of books, who knew he could read, and then he just walks back out. Nobody stops him. He doesn't check out the books. He just wanders away with them, and he introduces uh, patriarchy. It waves its hand for plot reasons at times. So yeah, he, he he reads a lot from very <clears throat> the book titles, very interesting sources oh about gosh. patriarchy. Why men rule, literally. So he takes back. He goes a bit alt right. He does. He becomes a bit of an incel. You give you give them an inch, they take a mile. No, um, he like basically he takes what he's learned because he's found, and he even says to Barbie's character like earlier on, he's like, "This world is great. Like, yeah. I'm valued and noticed, and I feel like a real person here." And like you know, a total because he's a total inversion of what it is to be a female character or a female person in reality, but flipped on its head. Yeah. He has no agency and no purpose in life. He has no other thoughts. Other than to be subservient to Barbie in Barbie land. Exactly. His whole character goal is to be with Barbie. And, you know, he parodies how, like, women are portrayed in media so strongly, which, you know, lands a little uncomfortably with some people. But, you know, it's very intentional. And so he takes back these concepts of patriarchy back to Barbie land and basically turns it into, I genuinely don't remember what he ends up calling it, Ken- Kendom? I think it was Kendom, yeah. Kendom? Because the society had no understanding of, like, the history of patriarchy and, you know, 
th- they have this very like surface level feminism. The the Kens embrace this because they have been subjugated by the women. They have experienced this oppression by the imbalance of e- equity. You know, feminism is not about putting women first and everything. It's about equity. It's about having, you know, an equal playing field and tr- not having gender bias. So we see how let's run amok to create a state where the Kens go mad on this news of patriarchy and force themselves into power, basically. And so Barbie comes back. She's got her new friends, Sasha and her mother, and she's so excited to show them Barbie land. They get there and they've taken over. The The dream house is now Ken's like horrific man cave. And it's there's just a lot of large TVs with horses running and this is all of the uh, this is all of the barbie dream houses have been turned into man caves basically yeah and it's but they do acknowledge they don't even know where the the mckens lived prior oh yeah no i just thought it was yeah they were like oh they're just they're just they just are around they're just around there there was no consideration given to the kens because this was barbie land prior it does make the scene where ken asks to stay over with barbie like kind of hit a little bit more because if he's like actually homeless he doesn't have a home he's sleeping on the beach <laughs> like is his job beach or does he just have nowhere else to go but also all of the women who were you know the president the supreme court the physicist the etc cetera, etc cetera, are now being subjugated into roles of service they are the bartender the masseuse you know the the girlfriend to ken because they, they they weren't expecting it and didn't have awareness of what was happening, they get almost entranced by these roles that they're forced into by society. Yeah, they lose all agency. And the only Barbie who is like kind of self-aware in the moment is stereotypical Barbie herself, who has been out in the real world and is now returned. She sees what's happening. Yeah. She has a confrontation with Ken, kind of a miniature one, where he is like, ah, how the turntables, you know? Like, he's just so, how does it feel? You know, because in this inverted flipped world, he has always been the character with no agency, and now she's the one with no agency. They flipped from one system of injustice to another, and he he's reveling in it he is loving it yeah and and stereotypical barbie has a a crisis um and gives up and loses all her sense of autonomy and self and just sort of like sits there and is like i can't i'm like i don't want to do this i want it to be perfect and the humans sasha and i can't remember sasha's mother's name and it's gonna gloria Gloria, thank you. They decide they're going to leave. They're going to go back to the real world. They try to leave Barbie land and they also get a stowaway in the form of Alan, played by Michael Sarah, yes. Who is the, um, how do we describe this character? He's Ken's best buddy, Kyle. He is Ken's best buddy as described in 1960s marketing. <laughs> he is not an alpha male. He is very gay coded. <laughs> I don't know what the light was. He was like, if I sit on another leather couch, like I'm going to lose it or something. And I was like, oh. <laughs> he is effeminate and does not fit in in Kendom because Kendom does not make space for him. And he also didn't really fit in Barbie Land, but it was more tolerable for him because it was not as dramatic of a difference. So he's a real fish out of water. And his only purpose in life, he's not seeking Barbie. Uh, he, he's not particularly interested romantically in Barbie. Uh, his only purpose in life is to be Ken's best bud. And he works really hard at it. I do. It's very funny because as they're driving, there's like a wall that they're building to like trap people either in or out of Ken land. There's a construction crew. Yeah. Yeah. Of Ben. Which harkens back to earlier when Barbie first is in the real world and she sees like a construction crew and she's like, oh, it's time for some girl talk. Like, we gotta, we gotta figure this out. And then she's like, why are there no women in charge of this like, construction yeah, crew? Yeah, she's like, why, yeah. why is this a construction crew of all men? Because in Barbie land, the construction crew is all women. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that was a, a good tie back. But then Alan like pops off with this like intense self defense physical combat yeah. routine which i i mean it made me laugh because i feel like every time you've played with like an action toy or like any kind of toy you put them in like weird positions and then have them like f- kick people and like whatever it's very action action figure like he basically is able to put the construction crew in their place and they go back to barbie land because they got to save the day yeah sasha finally clicks and goes no we have to save this 
um, she's she's invested now because she sees the same injustice is happening that she's frustrated with in the real in the real world. Yeah, and you get this sweet mother daughter kind of connection where they've been like they've been their their relationship has been kind of struggling. Uh, it's implied not really for any specific reason. Maybe it's just like you know teenage angst trying to figure yeah. yourself out, but whatever. But they have this real moment, mother daughter clicking moment, uh, and they go back to save the day to find that. Weird Barbie and, like, a lot of the, like, discontinued Barbies are able to... The freak show Barbies. Yeah, the yeah for lack of a better term. Uh, they have kept their autonomy. They know stuff is wild, um, and they're trying to figure out a solution. They didn't fit into the world that Barbie Land was either. Exactly. And they definitely don't fit into the world that... It's not just Barbies, it's Ken's, too. They, they're they all outsiders who don't fit into the forced... Can't believe Sugar Daddy Ken was, like, a real... <laughs> Now it's Sugar's daddy. I know, but but really? <laughs> yep. That's a real that's a real Ken. Um, but they don't fit into the con- conformity of the world either. So they all kind of come together along with Alan and uh Sasha and Gloria to hatch this plan to remind the other Barbies of their autonomy and basically deprogram them which they carry out by distracting <laughs> the Kens by appeasing to their interests long enough to kidnap the other Barbies and give them a straight talk about what's happening. We see the other Barbies immediately deprogram and join the cause, and they're able to manipulate the Kens into fighting amongst themselves, which happens in this insane musical number. And, you know, distracting them from the actual agenda that they were on of revising the Barbie Lane Constitution to enshrine male superiority into law. The Barbies are able to re-seize control of power, and because they've witnessed the systematic oppression that they just experienced, they're able to look more neutrally on the faults of their society and build a society not based on Barbie superiority or Ken superiority, but by equity, you know, treat, treating the outcasts and the Kens better and giving everyone autonomy. They're working on it. It doesn't happen overnight. Or at least it's implied that they're going to get there eventually, you know, they'll might have one or two, like there won't be any Kens yeah, on the know, Supreme Court anytime soon, but like a lower level court. Uh, you know, working towards equity. Yeah. You'll have some representation. Yeah. Working towards equity, but in the same way, like you got to settle parroting the real world where it's like yeah you'll have a job and maybe one day like you might be yeah on like a higher court or like be a ceo or something you know like the it's just yeah i just love how the the script is flipped in this movie and it's very like it's very clear it doesn't beat around the bush and at first i was like wow they're really on the nose with a lot of this messaging and then i was like this is barbie like you're going to be, you're going to say it how it is. And like, if you can't be and say exactly what you're going to say about Barbie in your Barbie movie, then like, what are you even here for? It tells you what it is up front and then executes it perfectly. So in, and in the final act of the movie, we have, you know, basically this, this resolution of Barbie and Ken, the stereotypical Barbie and Beach Ken, the original 1960s Barbie and Ken where Ken is able to actually do this thing that (laughs) in the real world men often aren't able to do, which is talk about his emotions. He talks about how he feels like he lacks purpose. And he's, he's hit at this before, but Barbie didn't engage with him because Barbie was focused on herself. They're able to have this emotional connection and encourage each other to grow. Barbie still feels out of place in this new world because she is stereotypical typical Barbie that she doesn't have a job beyond being beautiful. That is her job. Um, so she decides to go back to the real world. And I really love the scene because the, the original creator of Barbie shows up to kind of encourage her to go back into the real world and to like help her figure out her purpose. And I love the part where Barbie is asking like, so I don't have to ask permission to be human. Like, I don't have to be human. And that the incredibly aggressive standard that we hold the Barbie doll to as a society is the same standard we hold women to. And when you have like stereotypical, like OG Barbie being like, I'm just a pretty face. Yeah. Can I just be human? Yeah. Can I just be human? And to her creator, basically what I was like, dang, 
the layers. Anyway. And then we end on an amazing joke about <laughs> the first joke everyone ever makes about Barbie dolls is addressed in the final scene and it is brilliant and we will not spoil that further. No, yeah. Go see the movie if you haven't. But she's able to find happiness and a place. And she has Birkenstocks at the end of the movie, so. She does have Birkenstocks at the end of I the movie. I thought that was really funny. Ma- this movie is a joy. <laughs> I love it. It took a while to like summarize because there's so much in it. It's a very dense movie considering that it's not very long. It is absurdist and existentialist. It has a thousand things going on in it. There are a thousand references in it. It's only two hours and it's packed the entire time. It also transcends genre. What is it? Is it a drama? Is it a comedy? Is it a family movie? Mm, not a family movie. Take your older kids to this movie. It's Is it a musical? There is... A f- it, it full on switches modes to become a incredibly choreographed and directed musical for a period of time. It does it all, and it does it all really, really well. It's, this has the kind of production value of 1950s Hollywood movies, where it all it, you're constantly aware it's on a stage, and this is a production. But the production is incredible, and you just want to drink it all in. It's really amazing. It is, and I love how the fact that it transcends genre and it does all these different things. It does parallel the fact that Barbie is and does many things. Yeah, the self awareness that it has. Barbie is for play. Little girls or boys or whoever will play with a Barbie doll and turn Barbie into whatever they want, and that is the idealized. Version version of that i don't even know where to begin with unpacking all of the things you know we've touched on the feminism aspect of it we've touched on the idealism and the gender roles and and the and the search of perfection there's also things of like she goes to the mattel offices and is able to really have some soul searching about what is a corporation what is corporate feminism how do corporations use social issues to affect their brand and make you buy their product what is individuality going back to talking about like how mattel in many ways like critiques itself with this film yeah i do think like it was very interesting that they kept the scene in where the ceo is like oh we had like a woman in charge once or twice in the 80s when it was first cool we've built this company on women and it's like yeah you've built the company on the idea of selling toys to women and selling women like for lack of a better term you've built this company on women but like it was not built by women even so the ceo has forgotten that it was founded by a husband and wife and the wife played a very active role in creating barbie yeah he's just the ceo is (laughs) he's swallowed so much marketing bs he's not able to actually give her a real answer he's not a real person (laughs) will ferrell is fantastic in this he's great so many people just killed the roles in this movie. Yes. Like, one hun- the commitment, everybody was committed to the bit, and it was great. I'm it knows th- that it's absurd. Honestly, at times, I had a bit of a don't hug me, I'm scared vibe mm. as far as just how much it plays with expectation and, uh, you know, set design and just subverting actual reality. And, and connecting to Frances Ha and Lady Bird, I think a th- real through line is what does perfection mean and what are the flaws of seeking perfection? And also identity and finding yourself. Yeah. All the characters in these movies. How do you stand movies. out? Yeah, how do you stand out? And what mistakes will you make along the way to stand out? I think I think it's a really beautiful story of at the end finding happiness. I also think like the other films, Barbie doesn't find a storybook happiness. She just finds a way to make her own life. Yeah, she she becomes human in yeah. a literal but also metaphorical sense. And that's like her great big adventure. And she has this, she also has a very beautiful aspiration. Uh, she's like talking about how she wants to be the person giving ideas and not be the idea, which is so deep when you think about it. There's a great scene when she first enters the real world where she's at a bus stop And next to her is an older woman who is actually the real-life Barbie, the daughter of the creators of Barbie, Barbara Handler, which is a really touching cameo. It's it's nice to have that through line to the actual history of the product. But Barbie says, you're so beautiful to Barbara. And Barbara just says, I know, because Barbara is a human who has lived a life and has the confidence and and self-awareness to understand what beauty actually means. I I think that's a really wonderful scene. And it's so like deep and emotional and touching. And it lets you sit in that moment 
Yeah. And that's the same movie that can have a insane dance choreography sequence with like giant pink plastic houses. We got to talk about I'm Just Ken. Oh my gosh. This will be on my Spotify rap this year. <laughs> In the middle of all of the conflict of the third act, it just pivots into a full-on Jacques Demy style musical number. And it plays with knowing it cuts from them, all the Kens on the beach to being on this like idealized stage and then cuts back. It plays with the idea that this is not really happening, but we get this amazing musical number. It's like an opera. And it, it tells you right there in that moment that Gerwig has the chops to do an amazing job directing a musical. It's, Absolutely stunning, not just how well it's executed, but how it seamlessly slides back into the actual movie without feeling jarring. Yeah, the way this movie pivots from intense grounded scenes to then having those like wild stage musical numbers, it it works so well. And I also love, it kind of makes me laugh that the Kens start fighting, then they go into the dance, then they're like together singing about how they are Ken, and they're like united and then they forget what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah, they like fixed it with a song. Like <laughs> they fixed it with a song. And then they looked at each other and they were like, Should, weren't we supposed to like vote on something today? And it just made me laugh. It also made me laugh that when they go into battle, because again, patriarchy and horses, yes. um, they're going in there with like toy um, horse on horse. I forget what you call them now. Like hobby horse. Yeah. So they're like going into battle with these hobby horses and like fake suction cup arrows and like just fighting with toys. Like they are men just fighting with toys over literally nothing. The Mattel execs who are there are even like, even ask the CEO, like, are we in danger? And he's like, no, there's no real weapons here. It's perfection. Also, just a quick just a quick nod, because there's just so many funny little jokes and moments here and there. But the the scene with all the execs roller blading their way to Barbie land <laughs> is in black suits in black suits looking very serious. And they're like just roller skating in a group while these like moms are also like skating nearby, clearly doing like their like recorded workout routine or something through Venice beach. The very clearly looking like the cliche portrayal of like a mid century FBI G man, uh, but on rollerblades, like it's just Mattel. They're actually like super serious. Like, you know, they're like the FBI coming after you or whatever but they're on like rollerblades. I got to say, Will Ferrell's the CEO throughout this entire time. Seeing him in a suit, I could not stop thinking about his George W. Bush impression on SNL during the Bush presidency. Oh, yeah. It has to be modeled on that impression because there's, there's just too many similarities, but it's brilliant. No, he's great. I haven't watched a Will Ferrell movie in a while. And I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure I would call this a Will Ferrell movie because he's not like a huge role, but like- No, he's, he's just a piece so... of the ensemble. He's so good in it, though. Like, ugh, yeah, so good. No, he steals the scene repeatedly. Every time he's on scene, like on camera, I'm just laughing, wheezing, having a great time. Of um, all the amazing supporting roles, I think the only person who brings that kind of like stage stealing presence to it is Kate McKinnon. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. She's she's a, she's not in like very much of the movie when you think about it, but like no. You're right. She steals every scene she's in, and I'm here for Intensely it. Intensely memorable. So memorable. So funny. Um, and she's like perfect casting for Weird Barbie. She just, lo- you can just tell she's having a blast with the role. She's having a blast with the role, and she perfectly portrays Barbie that's like seen it all, so to speak. And she's like, you got guts, kid. You know, we've all been there. Like just this very like, she just knows so much more because of her experiences than like other Barbies. Yeah, because she's been ostracized. It, it, it's, it's just very wholesome to, to watch her perform. I do think it really, like, especially I the costumes in Lady Bird were really great, but the costuming in Barbie was, like, absolutely insane. Almost like it had 20 times the budget. 20 times the budget, and also, like, everybody was like, I'm going to recreate every obscure Barbie outfit Oh, the attention to detail is insane. The attention to detail is, oh my goodness. Like, even with, like, little stuff with, like, the fridge in Barbie at the beginning is, like, clearly a sticker on the inside of a plastic door. But then the details of all of her different Barbie outfits are, you know, calling back to different eras of Barbie. Even the different dream houses, yeah. The different different dream houses. The sets, like, you can't talk about this movie without pointing out the insane attention to detail 
that they put into building all of the Barbie memorabilia, but in like human size. I want to go to the Barbie's dream house. <laughs> yeah, you almost want to pause throughout and just just marvel at the production design. I think it's probably going to be a, a big com- competitor in award season for both production design and costuming. It's absolutely insane. I hope so. Uh, and then one other really small detail, but that I found hysterically funny was the fact that Barbie can't drink water or isn't used to drinking. Yeah. And so, like, it establishes multiple times at the beginning that she, like, just holds the cup up and, like, pretends to drink or whatever. And then when she meets the CEOs for the first time, she, like, pours water all over herself because she doesn't know how to drink. she's not real. (laughs) And then she tries to drink tea. It's just so funny. Ah, there were so many great running jokes and and little gags in this movie that it it would take forever to name them all. But that was one that I was like, I just had to mention it because it cracks me up. So that's Barbie. Absolute must-see cinema this year. Go see it if you haven't already. Go see it multiple times. It's an absolute delight. And I think it's a really interesting film to look at the career of Greta Gerwig and see how she's taken all of these very small, intimate ideas about cinema and relationships in cinema and put it onto such a grand stage. It's delightful. Just one of my favorites of the year. Yeah, and with all three of these movies, just the... The building, starting with Francis Ha and then moving to Barbie, the scale and the change, but at the same time, the groundedness that they have throughout, even Barbie is insane. But still, it is a really interesting trajectory to look at. And I'm really excited to see Gerwig's future films. I don't know how she's going to top Barbie, but I know she will. Um, Each of these films had exponential growth in scale and budget. So it's it's wild to think what Hollywood execs will give her next for Years, there's been a saying that women directors only get one shot at making a flop, and then they'll never be trusted with a big movie again. Mm -hmm. Gerwig has never flopped, and this is really the kick in the teeth that the industry's needed this year. It made tons of money. We know that her next big film is going to be the live-action adaptation of Snow White, Disney's most precious of their animated features. I'm really curious to see how she plays with the gender roles of that film. I know there's been some discourse from Peter Dinklage and such about the problematic nature of the portrayal of dwarfs in the original movie. I know Greta Gerwig's going to just flip it all on its head if Disney will let her. Really curious to see how, how that works out, but also just what's next from her. And I really hope this branded content that she's doing is amazing, but I really hope she's able to also tell us smaller stories like Lady Bird, like Frances Ha going forward. Yeah, I am really excited to see what she does next. I've heard... Rumors floating around, and I don't know if this is confirmed, that she is potentially going to be directing an adaptation of The Chronicles of Narnia. Yes, that is for Netflix, for a series. Another near and dear, another near and dear children's classic. I really hope that that takes off and makes it through production because I would love to see the reimagining of Narnia that she could bring. And I know she would do something really incredible and different with it, which is something that I think any adaptation of Narnia going forward could really benefit from. I definitely feel like also the the 2005 era Disney Narnia adaptations were so grounded in trying to be the next Lord of the Rings that they weren't able to embrace the childlike lens of Narnia and the mysticism. And that's something I think Gerwig could really excel in. Much in like how Guillermo del Toro's original like ideas for The Hobbit was much more like whimsy and insane. I really hope they let Gerwig do something crazy and different because there's a lot of design options you can take with uh, the mythological creatures that are presented in the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. And there's a lot of different design choices you can take that would be absolutely fascinating. And again, there's also a lot of space and breath, I think, in those stories to include your own spins on characters and story. So I hope it happens. Fingers crossed. I loved those books growing up. So Netflix, for all their faults um, as a producing production company, by the way, pay your actors. Th- th- they do tend to give a high degree of freedom to their directors and their talent. So I'm hoping that Gerbeck really is able to do what she wants with Narnia. That, that will be a really interesting project. Yeah, I will be following that one very, very closely. All right. Thank you for joining us. Please leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Give us a five-star review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Our next episode will be a spooky time looking at some of the very earliest histories of the slasher and thriller genres. We'll be looking at the 1959 British classic Peeping Tom and then tying it into its almost film sibling, Psycho. 
sharing a lot of common lineage and influence on each other. And then looking at Edgar Wright's 2021 film, Last Night in Soho, which draws heavily on influence from Peeping Tom and even makes repeated references to Peeping Tom. So that should be a really fun look at some both common and uncommon horror films. Thank you, Sarah, so much for joining us. You were great. I can't wait to do this again. Well, thank you for having me. I had a blast and I'm excited to dig into these topics with you next time as well. So excited. See you all soon. Bye.